Hello, and welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, Elwin Robinson, the creator and founder of Genetic Insights. And today we are carrying on the conversation about certain common health myths that are out there today, and really diving deep into them and figuring out, are they true? Are they false? What's the real story behind them? So Elwin, we're going to kick it straight off with the first one on our list today, which is getting healthy is expensive. Mm. Yeah, this is a great uh, one. And to some degree, it's not a myth. To some degree, it is true that it can be more expensive to be healthy than to be unhealthy in numerous different ways. And this is really a shame. You know, if we think about, uh, let's say, 100 years ago, uh, it, to be unhealthy was like an effort, right? You had to spend money on drugs, alcohol, smoking, you know, <laughs> uh, unhealthy foods. It was like a challenge. These days, of course, it is a challenge to... So basically, it was like poisoning yourself was something that used to require active effort on your part to achieve. Plenty of people still did it. Uh, these days, not poisoning yourself is a significant challenge and often is uh, more expensive. So I want to acknowledge this is not entirely a myth, right? Uh, a common one, I don't know if it's one of the other myths we're going to talk about today or if we covered it last week. Um, <laughs> it's been a while since we did the previous myths episode, but, you know, about organic food. Um, and, of course, organic food. What, what does organic food mean? Not poisoned, or probably in reality just less poisoned food, um, is actually more expensive in the vast majority of cases. So that's a fact. Uh, it's also true that if you follow the type of um, health advice that I promulgate, which is the find out the root causes of what's actually going on for you and address them, as opposed to trying to follow some one size fits all you know, diet scheme, exercise scheme, detox scheme, or whatever is out there these days, um, that, that does usually cost more money because it requires some degree of testing. Now, to me, it's actually an infinitely cheaper and more affordable approach, ultimately, because I have met, and to be honest, I was one of those people who literally, you know, uh, spent over a decade trying different one size fits all approaches you know, spent plenty of money on whatever, supplements, herbs, procedures, practitioners, all the rest of it, to still really not get anywhere. In fact, my health got worse between the ages of 30 and 40, uh, which is not that unusual, I know in general, but it is unusual for someone who's trying so hard <laughs> to get healthier. Um, so to me, so I guess, you know, that's part of the argument that I would make that um, it's not that getting healthy doesn't cost anything in a lot of cases. It's more just the, the alternative costs more. So let me be very, um, you know, let me be specific about this. So yes, it is true. If your income is entirely fixed, let's just say you had no opportunity to work and you were getting a certain amount from someone, family member, government, whatever, and there was no way for that to change. So if you were in that kind of circumstance, it is probably accurate to say that to live a healthier life overall, depending on your environment a little bit, certainly if you live in a city, is going to be more expensive than to uh, live an unhealthy life. There's all kinds of reasons for this. I mean, government subsidies is a big one, right? Uh, government takes your money in the form of tax with threats of violence behind it, and then it gives it to... Um, people who create unhealthy food, <laughs> while often regulating and making life more difficult for people who make healthy food. So, you know, there's all kinds of things that make this the case. But anyway, now, if you are living in nature, if you, if you are, there are a lot of things that are very good for all your health that are free. And that is something that I don't think we emphasize enough on this podcast. I think the reason for that is because I kind of assume that everyone already knows that if they made radical changes to their basic lifestyle that they would be healthier. Most people, either they know when they do it or they know when they don't do it, but like I'm not gonna be the one to convince them. And so what I'm trying to do is say, look, if it's, yes, okay, it would be better for you to be outside most of the day, but if that's just not gonna happen in your case for whatever reason, right, then there are things you can do to mitigate that. Yes, it would be better to eat, eat you know, a very healthy, pure diet, but if that's 
not just not going to happen in your case and there's things you can do to mitigate that um you know etc right like you know i'm working with more and more people who are what would you call them high performers high earners whatever um people with you know entrepreneurs and ceos and that kind of thing and if i go to them and start saying yeah you know you need to uh you know go out and get several hours of sunlight and fresh air every day and then uh, you need to, you know, spend this amount of time meditating and this many time, this amount of time doing breathing practices and this amount of time focusing on what you're grateful for and all the rest of it. Like, I mean, some of them are open to it. You know, there's always those exceptions, but most of them are like, you know, it's not going to happen. My calendar. Well, is... yeah, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to say, I don't, I just don't have enough time in the day to do all of that. I've got, there's so many other obligations I have, especially for work, things like that. Yeah, and it's it's absolutely that, and it's also a willpower issue. You know, willpower is a finite resource. I remember I read a great book by this about that years ago. I can't remember the name of the author, but I think the book was just called Willpower. Anyway, she basically describes how, um, yeah, you know, different people, maybe with different circumstances, have different amount of willpower available to, to them, but everyone only has a certain amount. And every time you make a decision, to some degree, it is... Uh, like at expense of that willpower as well. So that's why, for instance, like going through and checking your email first thing in the morning is probably not a great idea if you're trying to achieve things in the world because you've got to go through all these decisions. Do I read this? Do I delete this? Do I open this and all this? And like you've used up half of your decision-making power before you got anything meaningful done. Um, so yeah, decision, uh, you know, willpower is a finite resource. These people who are, you know, high performers, whatever you want to call it, they want to dedicate their... Uh, willpower to whatever they're trying to do, change the world, get rich, whatever. Um, and so they don't have a load to spare to force themselves to, you know, do all these healthy practices, unfortunately, or, I mean, that's their choice, right? That's how they're choosing to prioritize things. And you may not be a, a rich high performer, but you may be someone who, you know, has a bunch of children who are dependent on you and, you know, you just can't afford to do that. You may be uh, in all kinds of positions that, you know, make it not possible for you. Oh, exactly. So I always want yeah, you also may be working two jobs just to try and make ends meet or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And I'm saying, you know, usually that people do that because they have dependents, right, of some kind. But yeah, it could be parents are dependent on you. It could be, yeah, all kinds of things. Um, and so, yeah, so I want to give realistic advice. And that's why, you know, I want to give hacks about, you know, things that can make a huge difference. Like, you know, if if it's the thing for you, nutrition, if it's the thing for you, toxins, if it's the thing for you, hormones, uh, because they can profoundly change the quality of your life with very little effort. And despite you having to make these very difficult lifestyle changes. However, if you're watching this, uh, you know, you've watched some of my episodes and you're thinking oh, a lot of this costs money and this approach is very expensive. The truth is some people really are in a very bad position where they have no spare money and no spare time. Some people are in a very uh, gifted position where they have plenty of spare money and spare time. But usually people fall in like one or the other, right? So basically because they work. So if you work, generally you have some money, you have a reasonable amount of money, spare, possibly investable in something, um, but you don't have time. And if you don't work, then you're kind of in the opposite. You have more time available, probably less money. Or maybe, you know, someone else is earning the money and you don't feel as free to spend it on whatever you feel like or whatever. And so if you are one of those people who has more time than money, there are absolutely a lot of things that you can do for your health, which are extremely impactful. And we have talked about this already in, you know, I did a couple of episodes on this, I think, Chrissy, that we can link to the daily habits and the lifestyle episodes where, you know, all of which advice was 100% free and 100% extremely uh, beneficial for health. Um, so I think uh, it is a myth in the sense that if you don't have money, then hopefully that's because you are not working, as you just said, 60 hours a week, two jobs and all the rest of it. Um, and it means you have a bit more time on your hands and therefore you can invest that time. Um, and so some of the most valuable things you can do that are completely free, I'll just list a few. As I said, those episodes went through in more detail. Um, being in the countryside uh, as opposed to the city first and foremost. Um, once you're in the countryside, getting fresh air, um, exercising, right, moving, certainly walking, maybe going up hills, maybe 
uh, you know, climbing, if that's an option for you, um, any kind of, you know, natural movements I'm a big fan of, as opposed to, you know, going into this artificial lights, air conditions, you know, gym environment and running on a machine. I'm not as much of a fan of that. If No, exactly. And we just recorded the episode <laughs> on light and that that's a nutrient as well. So getting outside is very important and free. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, uh, in terms of being outside, so fresh air, also sunlight, um, especially the first thing in the morning and or the last thing before the sunset sunlight has a higher percentage of that red light that you just mentioned there, Chrissy, which is you know, very healing and beneficial, as we just talked about in that episode. Uh, meditation. I mean, that is possibly the most free thing that you can do. There is literally no cost involved in that at all, unlike maybe getting to the countryside might still cost you some money or something. Uh, that's something that you can pretty much do anywhere. If you have a chair or if you have a bed, <laughs> then you are able to meditate. I hope you have those things. Um, and that's something if you spend, you know, some people say 20 minutes twice a day, some people, you know, we're fans here of Joe Dispenza, both of us, I know. So, you know, you can go for one of those, maybe one hour and one go, but something like that, if you do that consistently, um, if you change your brain waves, basically what we're talking about with meditation, let's be specific. We're talking about going from a beta waves, which is your kind of everyday thinking, or maybe even a high beta, which is like your stressed thinking down to at least alpha waves, which is more that kind of uh, dreamlike symbolic level of consciousness, or even down to, you know, theta and delta, which is that deep relaxation, stroke deep sleep. That's incredibly rejuvenating for not just the mind and the brain, but for the whole body. Uh, it's been shown to have countless benefits. So that's something that's 100% free, 100% beneficial. Um, focusing on what you're grateful for, focusing on forgiveness. I've talked about, you know, in another episode recently about the power of uh, doing things like bioenergetics. Um, not the repeat one, although that can also be good, but the uh, the one where you are getting chronic tension out of your body. Uh, that's something, again, you can have a practitioner guide you or go to a, like a retreat and do it or something, but you can also just follow along with YouTube videos or follow along with what it says in a book and do it completely free. The vast majority of what I've done in that regard has been that way, doing it completely free. And it's been one of the most beneficial things. Uh, breathing practice, whether we're talking about, um, you know, simple becoming aware of your breath, like a um, heart coherence breathing, where you basically slow down your breathing to a very steady and gentle five to six breaths a minute. That's been proven to increase the level of your uh, heart coherence, which has been associated with um, obviously reduced stress, but increased cardiovascular health, increased brain health, changing those brain waves again, uh, extension of longevity, all that kind of stuff. Heart Math Institute, they've done all the, the research on the benefits of that. They sell the devices where you can see if it's working or not, but honestly, I can tell you from my experience, if you actually just slow your breath down to about 10 to 12 seconds for every in and out breath, then within five minutes of doing that, your, your heart gets massively more coherent. You can take my word for it if that's enough, or you can buy a device and discover that for yourself. But it kind of really is as simple as that. They also say, you know, focus on the air of your heart. Great. Focus on like feelings of love and gratitude. Great. Um, that is great. I'm not disparaging that, but I'm saying even that isn't necessary. Even you can do it while you're, you know, whatever people do, scrolling through Instagram reels or, you know, whatever. You don't have to treat it as a sacred experience, so you certainly could. But just slowing your breathing like that down and calming it temporarily uh, has been shown to be very beneficial. And also um, breathing through your nose. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. You brought up Breath the breathing. So I was like, ah, oh, that's really, you know, that that's cost effective. Just close your mouth and breathe through your nose. <laughs> It's a great point, actually. Yeah, not for some people, not always as easy if they have real, you know, issues. But um, but it's possible to kind of unblock it. And we talked about that in the Buteco episode. Again, hundred percent for free. You don't have to buy Vix or Sudafed or whatever. You can just do the technique that we talked about in that episode. So yes, absolutely, breathing through your nose is a very good, profoundly beneficial thing for your health. That is a hundred percent free. Uh, moving regularly, so not just occasionally going to the countryside and doing stuff like I said earlier, but making sure you get up and move throughout the day is something that is very beneficial. Prioritizing and making sure you get enough sleep is you know, extremely beneficial. Now, 
you know, you've probably heard those. You might be like, yeah, I do one or two of those or whatever. But here's the thing. Uh, if you were to actually do all of the things I just said, and remember, all of them are free, and you do all of them regularly, like, say, every day, um, you will experience a significant shift in your health, and you will not have spent a penny. And that's why, ultimately, I would say that being healthy is expensive is a myth. Very good points. And thank you for all of those, you know, things that we can absolutely access today at no cost. And like you said, it's just down to us to put in the time and the effort and the energy. And sometimes that can be a little bit lacking, but just making a start in the beginning can really help shift everything. And like you said, getting healthy doesn't have to be expensive. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you brought up energy because yeah, you're right. There are all kinds of exceptions to this, right? Um, if you have severe injuries, maybe you can't walk, you know, if you have severe trauma, maybe you can't sleep very easily, you know, all of that kind of stuff. If you are se severely fatigued, um, then maybe a lot of these things you're not gonna be able to do. And then yes, in those very specific circumstances, then health does get more expensive because you've got to deal with those root cause issues that have now manifested. But I guess I'm saying for the vast majority of people, uh, it can be very inexpensive to get better. Wonderful. And that leads us into myth number two, which is genes make you fat. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as someone who sells genetic reports, including about the connection between your genes and weight loss, uh, you might be wondering why I would put that as a myth. Um, this is probably one of the things I get asked about the most often when I go on other people's podcasts, which I seem to be doing a lot of. And uh, I always acknowledge before I talk about that there is a connection between genes and weight, which there absolutely is. You know, there is also the reality that uh, in the US, 100 years ago-ish, uh, people had the same caloric intake as now on average. So, uh, some, depending on what source you go to, some people would even say slightly more. And they had quite a lot of refined sugar, white sugar, quite a lot of like refined flour, white flour. Uh, quite a lot of saturated fat, whether it's from dairy, uh, meat, eggs, and yet the obesity rate uh, was around 2% and in the US, and right now it's about 60%. So what does that tell us? Obviously there is more to it than genetics, right? There is something else going on, and I'm so glad this is part of the national conversation now, especially in the US, because the US is especially bad in this regard, but there are plenty of other countries that are hot on your heels, Americans, for <laughs> including my own. The UK obesity rates are really not that much lower. And there are other countries as well, like in um, you know Central Asia, for instance, as well, that are hot on the heels with uh, obesity and uh, diabetes and stuff like that. And so it's kind of a global problem, although it is, you know, the US is probably one of, well, it's certainly the, it's the worst affected of the larger countries. Um, and there has to be more to it than genetics because of the simple stuff I just said. So it's easy to blame genetics. Now, having said all of that, genetics do play a part. There is a reason why with some people, no matter how much they eat and no matter how unhealthy they get, it doesn't show up as being overweight. I guess I would be an example of that. And many other clients I've met would be as well. Um, and I guess people said to me, you know, ah, it's different as you get older than, oh, I'm 44 now. You know, it's still like, as soon as I feel any less healthy, that it always leads to weight loss, not weight gain. That's, that's how it is for me and that's how it is for some people. And so there is a genetic component to that. There's also, you know, kind of, what's the word, situational, environmental component to that. Um, but there is a genetic component to it. However, the genetic component is pretty minimal and it doesn't really get to the root of the issue. And that's why I'd call it a myth. Because, as I said, if you actually, um, even if you have a genetic predisposition to be overweight, and absolutely some people do, or if you have a genetic predisposition for something else which contributes to weight gain, like for instance, hypothyroidism, like for instance, uh, insulin resistance, like for instance, just even a sweet tooth. That's something that we have a genetic report on. Um, and loads of other things, you know, there's like a, a couple of dozen different things, high cortisol, that, you know, uh, estrogen dominance, all that kind of stuff that we do have different reports on in the uh, genetic insights weight loss category. Um, so, but all that's telling you is 
once you are no longer optimal, once you start to go downhill health-wise, once you start to become whatever, depleted, toxic, imbalanced, however you want to call the not optimal anymore-ness, um, for some people it shows up as gaining weight. And so that is the case. But I would say it's not that genes are the reason why you're overweight or you can't lose weight. G uh, genes are the reason why you being sick shows up as being overweight as opposed to showing up in a different way. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, so I think that's the crucial. Uh, and again, it's not like one side's right, one side's wrong. They're both right in a way. Yes, there is a component to why you gain weight or why you can't lose weight. So you're right, not arguing with that. But on the other hand, it's really not a, oh, well, therefore I just have to live with it and accept. Now, if you want, like anything, it's up to you. If you want to live with and accept something, then that's totally fine. But it's not a reason to f feel like you have no choice and that you have to give up, right? Um, as we know, like I don't really care about appearance very much, Chrissy. Um, we can talk about that in the episode coming soon, I guess. Um, so I'm not really bothered about it from that perspective at all. But uh, and if I was overweight, I wouldn't care about it from that perspective. But I would care about it from the perspective of health, right? And again, not that actually having excess value, especially if it's a moderate amount, is innately unhealthy. There are actually some research to indicate that if it's a moderate amount, some health outcomes are actually better. And my view on that would be is because fat is a good toxin storage. And so often the very unhealthy people often are actually look quite underweight, as I did. Um, but it's more an issue of that the excess weight is a sign of there being something wrong, as opposed to the wrongness itself. Again, as long as it's moderate. Now, obviously, if you're carrying an extra 100 kilos, 200 pounds around, that's putting a strain on your heart and everything. And so that has its own problems. But, you know, an extra 20, 30 pounds, even kilos, maybe, um, I don't know if it's innately unhealthy, but the problem is that it points to that there is something unhealthy that's causing that situation. And that's why I would prioritize addressing it and not just blame genes and go, oh, well, there's nothing I can do. Very good point. Yeah, that's the ultimate thing of looking at. I mean, that's one of the things we, we were. I've been discovering along this path as uh, genetic insights has grown, and we've had these discussions and been on the podcast. Is that your your genes are not your destiny? It's you know, it's the how can you say? Yeah, it's that blueprint that's there, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that is what will occur. It's a lot about environment. It's a lot about everything else. Yes, it's a uh, proclivity or um, it's an increased risk, but it's still up to you to manifest it or not. Well said. And that takes us into myth number three, which is, oh, I love this one. The doctor always knows more than you. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I could really go into it with this one. Um, now, let me... Let me start with positivity for a second. Um, and I'm trying to also, I don't know if I'm doing this like 100%, but I'm trying to also acknowledge, because life isn't black and white, right? There's, there's an element of truth to all these myths. Um, and so the element of truth to this myth is your doctor definitely knows some stuff way more than you, almost certainly, unless you are also a doctor. So one of the things that doctors are expert in is they understand in much more detail than probably you, yes, even if you're very well versed in health, about the myriad ways that the body can go wrong. That's something that they know pretty well. Now, are they experts in understanding the root causes of why it has gone wrong? That's more debatable, I'll talk about that in a sec, but how it goes wrong, the ways it goes wrong, um, they're very good at, you know, cataloging and understanding that I would say in general and other things that doctors are very good at understanding is the treatments that they that is in re their remit and so that basically boils down in the majority of cases to uh, drugs pharmaceuticals and surgery those are the interventions that they largely utilize um, and those are the ones that they are again probably more expert in than you in the case of pharmaceuticals 
uh, in the vast majority of cases and definitely more expert than you in the case of surgery and that's <laughs> oh, yeah. because you are a surgeon so in some ways they do know more than you and that's important to acknowledge right um, however so there's a few issues and actually before I address this I would want to address just the point of authority figures in general because I think this is really super important I had um I, I did an interview recently for um yeah, I actually remember who this was, Bio Optimizers Podcast, check it out. They sent me some free products, they were good. Um, and the host, I think it was Wade, he asked me a question. He said, when I was describing my story, which I do in almost all these podcasts of, you know, how I came to what I did, what I've now ended up doing, uh, he said, you know, why didn't you, because I tell the story, I tried all this and it didn't work and I tried all this and it didn't work. And, uh, you probably heard me say it. Um, he said, why didn't you give up? What, like, what was it that made you keep going? You know, it sounds like you have an incredible level of resilience. And I said, that's so funny because up until recently, I've kind of got a lot better at this, but up until recently, I was going on all these podcasts going, I'm not very resilient. I have a very low level of resilience and it's because of my genetics um, that, you know, I have that tendency again, back to that conversation. Um, it's much more difficult for me to be resilient because of my genes. And so... And that has shifted. We're going to do an episode two where I talk about my own health journey. So I'll talk about that then. Um, but so I had to think about it. This honestly, 80% of these questions I get on these podcasts are always the same, but this was a new one. So I had to think about it. And the answer I came out with was I think it's, and we have done episodes on this, I think it's more of a personality thing rather than having any gift. I think it's just my disagreeableness. Um, I think it's just like if every expert and authority both mainstream but also you know I talked about you know, functional medicine and nutritionists and microbiome expert and chiropractor and craniosacral and osteopath and uh, naturopath and on and on and on often several of each um, as well as yeah numerous medical doctors and specialists just because they say something doesn't mean that I go oh well that must be true then now it's obviously easier um, to have that, like, I'm going to not listen to you if they're telling you something you don't want to hear, admittedly, right? So if someone says, yeah, I know you're in agonizing pain, but we can't find anything wrong, I guess it's easier to say, I'm not going to believe you versus, you know, if there was no problem and they said there's nothing wrong, maybe it'd be easier to believe them. Um, but... I think my general personality is being always to question authority. And so I, I kind of I don't consider myself an authority as well and don't present myself as one. Um, I know some people, you know, I'm a researcher, I'm a, you know, explorer or whatever my friend calls it, um, always trying to learn more. But, and that's why, I, you know, to the degree I am an authority to anyone, I'd say, you know, I like the, the, catchphrase from Timothy Leary back in the 60s, think for yourself, question authority. I think that's a very good way to live your life in relation to everything. I actually think it's sad how true it is, like how utterly unreliable and untrustworthy authority figures are in this day and age. Yes, I agree um, with you on that. I saw, you know... Um, I won't, yeah, I won't name names, but someone popular in the health space these days talking about how, you know, back in the 1960s, something like 85% of people trusted the government and just wouldn't believe that the government would do something bad or lie to them. And now it's more like 15%. And I actually think that's progress in a way, because I think the government was probably pretty much just as dishonest in the 1960s as it is now. Um, so it's definitely progress in the quest of truth and maybe even liberty. Um, but in terms of the impact on people's psyches, it is pretty devastating because most people have are not disagreeable. As I talked about in my episode on this, I, I really think that um, disagreeability, as well as you know the other four on the scale, is like a mutation, you know, maybe a genetic mutation that is unusual. Like, so it is normal for a mammal, and you don't have to believe in apes. Sorry, you don't have to believe we're descended from apes. I know probably some of our viewers don't, but you don't have to believe in that to believe that we are in the category mammal, right? We're very similar. We're 
warm-blooded, hairy creatures. Um, and so mammals in general, with the exception of only cats, I believe, and even then depends on the species, the type of cat, um, are all pack animals. They're all very much group animals. And so what that means is that in order to decide what is true and what is real and what is right, the vast majority of us do not start from first principles and work it out. What we do is basically two things. We look at whoever has the most power and go, what's true, what's real, what's right? And then we look around at what everyone else is doing and go, what's real, what's true, what's right? And especially if those two are in concordance, so if an authority is telling us something, most people are going along with it, um, it is very difficult for most people to not go along with that. And so this drives people who are into truth, like me, crazy, or it used to, I'm a bit more accepting of the world these days, but it, it can drive, because it's like, but this is so obviously not true and facts and logic and rationality and all the rest of it. And like, but everyone is going in the other direction or not everyone, say the majority. And you think, you know, why? But you just have to understand this is human nature. And so the reason I said it's sad is because it, you know, it kind of is sad that there's been this inversion of the world where I do think, though the 1960s probably wasn't the time, I do think maybe when we were, our societies and groups were smaller, that those in charge on average were less um, destructive, self-destructive, psychopathic, deceitful, power-hungry, whatever we might want to call it. Like, I think... If the world was as bad as some of the, say, extreme conspiracy theorists think it is, of everyone in any position of power being utterly evil, the world would be worse than it is. So, and it, yes, it could be worse. It could be far worse. You know, just look at any dystopian sci-fi. It's an example of how the world could get worse. So not everyone in the position of power is evil, is, you know, destructive, all that kind of stuff. Absolutely not. However... I do think that the percentage has shifted more and more in that direction. I think when we had smaller groups, especially the, the people in charge, the authorities would have the well-being of their group much more in their mind. Uh, they would feel much more connected to them. And so I think as the world has become more globalized and internationalized and um, depersonalized and all the rest of it, it's easier and easier to... I mean, just an example, like... You know, the police person, for instance, in any small town or city used to be, they grew up in that town or city. And so, okay, now they're in charge of uh, upholding the law, but they know a lot of the people there. They grew up with them. They're friends with them already. And then you can tell, you know, an authoritarian government, for instance, will not want that. And they will try and move them so that the people policing, controlling a population, they don't have any ties to it. They prefer it because then they can be... Yes, it does remove the chance of corruption, so there's some benefit, but overall what it means is like they don't care about that population anymore, right? Um, you know, they don't have any ties to them. So it's much easier if the centralized authority says, you know, if they're protesting about something like lock them up, beat them up or whatever, like they're much more likely to do it if it's not their friends and family, right? So that's the main problem. That's the point. So anyway, um, so I think it is sad that, People like me who innately distrust authority and assume that whatever they say is not true are generally correct. Um, I wish it were more that I was and people like me were more kooks and crackpots and, you know, were generally wrong and that government and those in charge in general were trustworthy and reliable and all the rest of it. But, it, you know, it's just not the way it is. I know. So... I was going to say, because also bringing it back to the point with the doctors as well. and Well, yeah, I was about to. Oh, yeah, yeah. go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so if we believe that about government, and let's say it's easier to believe that about big business, right? They don't necessarily have their customers or even their employees' best interests at heart, right? So that is the system within which any class of authority is educated and rules are enforced, and that includes doctors. And so if you don't believe the government, which most people don't any, anymore, you don't, or you don't believe mm, you know, what they say and that they have your best interests at heart, if you don't believe that big business has, you know, is reliable and that has your best interests at heart, um, then 
the very, you know, doctors, unfortunately, are part of that system. They're part of the they, machine, yeah. They have to conform to the government, otherwise they will not have their license anymore. Um, they have to conform to all the institutions controlled by the government. Um, they are often educated and indoctrinated and have to conform to with the relevant business sectors like the pharmaceutical industry, maybe also insurance industry, various things like that. And so they are not isolated from that general tendency. Um, now, doesn't again, with individual people, remember the world will be a lot worse than it was if everyone in any position of authority was bad. And I'm not saying that they are or corrupt or whatever, dishonest, whatever you want to call it. Um, but the point is, I think the accurate way of looking at things is to say, Anyone who is in a position of authority in such a corrupt system, and doctors are in the category, because doctors have a lot of power. They have power of life and death. They can uh, you know, have you restrained and basically imprisoned, uh, sectioned or whatever. Um, they can do all kinds of things to you. you know, just like with the police, it's a bit of a tentative power because you know they do have oversight and stuff, but it's there. And so... Um, Rather than being disappointed that all of these authority figures, you know, are not living up to the highest principles of integrity at all times and only have your interest, in, you know, best interest in mind, all the rest of it, I would more look at it and be like, be happy and impressed and grateful when you find some that are uh, not in that category of being dishonest and corrupt and all the rest of it, because that's unfortunately the norm in this world as it currently is, and that's why. You know, I, I, I don't want to be one of those person who I'm not a doctor and therefore I only bring on doctors to try and give myself credibility. I don't want to be that type. And so we didn't have any doctors on for ages when we first did this podcast. But I wanted to bring a few on recently because I kept seeing these comments like, oh, my doctor wouldn't listen to this and they would never, you know, apply what you say here. Oh, and, I, and I wanted to give examples. Actually, there are a bunch out there. there. There are some good doctors and we've had on a few. We'll have on a few more, hopefully. Uh, we have Dr. Miriam on, who I know, you know, I work with her now with some of these, um, uh, what's the word, highly committed clients. And, um, and yeah, you know, she's fantastic. She's 100% focused on optimization and finding and addressing root causes and stuff like that. And she's not the only one. There's a bunch of them out there. Um, so I don't want to be negative. And, and it's fantastic if you find someone who both – you know, is looking to find and address root causes and really understand them and also has all the benefits we talked about earlier, right? They understand all the myriad ways the body can go wrong. They understand all the different pharmaceutical things. Maybe they understand all the different surgical things. I mean, that's a best of all world scenario. And so that's really great. Um, and so I don't want to be down on doctors in general, but the, I think the original thing we started with and the point that I hope I've dismantled now is this idea that just because someone has a specific designation, a specific title, a specific credential, that that means that they are innately trustworthy or reliable or believable. Or have your best interests at heart and where it could be their own interests. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, I'm not picking on doctors. This is true for any category of person in anywhere. I mean... You know, politicians, if you say politicians are unreliable, untrustworthy, who's going to disagree with you, right? Not many people. But we have to understand that the politicians create the laws and, you know, usually are involved in appointing the people or at least not firing the people who um, make up the institutions that govern all of these centers of authority, whether we're talking about doctors, teachers, uh, professors, uh, you know, whatever, uh, judges, lawyers, all the rest of it, like these same politicians who almost everyone agrees are untrustworthy are supposed to at least be, or, you know, let's say the politicians plus the people, the, the billionaires, the big business people, whatever, who fund everything between them, they are kind of in control and in charge of all these institutions that govern all of these professions so if we don't trust big business and we don't trust the politicians, why are we trusting the institutions and why are we unquestionably trusting the members of institutions? And remember, unquestionably being the issue. Not that you shouldn't trust anyone, but you know, unquestionably trusting anyone would be more the thing that uh, I would take issue with.
And so I don't want to be negative. I think there are even some business people who I think have good intentions and are honest. I think there are even some politicians who uh, have good intentions and are honest uh, to some degree. Um, but uh, <laughs> so I don't want to be negative about any category of people because that's prejudice and there's always exceptions. But I guess the point that I'm making is that uh, in the case of doctors, um, they can be extremely awesome, but I wouldn't trust them just because they have a title, just like I wouldn't trust anyone just because they have any title. Genetic Insights provides cutting edge, affordable DNA testing, giving you access to over 500 health reports that can help you in three key ways. They may be able to resolve your existing health challenges even when nothing else has worked. Using simple lifestyle changes, their reports can help you reduce your risk of developing future health challenges that you may be genetically predisposed to. And they can help you feel more confident in your health by showing you where you are genetically strong. Unlike most other genetic health testing companies, Genetic Insights tests over 83 million different variations in your genes, guaranteeing 99.7% accuracy across all of their DNA reports. They cover almost every aspect of health, including digestive issues, cardiovascular health, weight loss, hormonal and blood sugar balance, as well as nutrient needs, allergies and intolerances, and so much more. Using their system is quick and easy and reading the reports is simple. If you've done an Ancestry DNA test, you can simply download your raw DNA data, upload it to the Genetic Insights platform, and within a few hours, you will have access to genetic reports which give you a risk score for each specific issue and scientifically validated recommendations based on your individual genetic profile. Everything in your reports are based on scientific studies and there are citation links throughout every report. If you are serious about optimizing your health and wellness and feeling great, then getting access to your genetic insights reports may be the most important health investment you will ever make. In the reports, not only will you gain insights into how to overcome existing health challenges and avoid future issues, you'll also discover which types of dietary, lifestyle, and even supplement protocols are best for your unique genetics. To get your unique genetic health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and use code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. That's geneticinsights.co using coupon code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. And that's also the other part too, if you are, where I would come from too, is if you are a type of person who is doing your own research, who is your own advocate for your health, then, you know, bringing that information to your doctor, don't, don't assume that they know this because they may not, depending on what they've studied, where their interests are and things like that, especially if you are, you know, you have a health condition that you're finding debilitating or, or a loved one as well. I, that, that's the part for here, of what, especially why I love doing this podcast is bringing the education to people to put the power back into their own hands that that white coat, or like you said, anybody in a position of authority, doesn't necessarily mean that they know more than you or that you have to do or take what they say as that's the last, that's the final, uh, how do I say, yeah, the final word on yeah. it. And I'm glad you mentioned that. Also, don't take the dismissal. Like just an, another profession, I've been talking to a bunch of accountants and tax specialists recently, and... Um, it, you know, it's a situation where it's a bit gray area, tricky. Um, and I, I finally spoke to someone the other day who actually at least had questions and I would say quite, sorry, who had answers and I'd say quite sophisticated answers to my questions. And a lot of them, the answers were kind of similar to answers I give. So that it's context dependent. So if I ask a question, well, is this the case? And they'd be like, well, it depends. In this context, it is. And this is, you know, and all kind of explanations. And then I was thinking back to other people. And then when I asked the same questions, they're like, eh, and they, I can't quite remember how they did it, but they kind of give the impression that that's a bit complicated and it's a bit above your head. And, you know, I can't explain it to you right now, but just trust me on this. You know, these kind of answers. And I know, you know, in my naivety, I think a lot of my life, um, I have a certain naivety where I think if someone says something, it must be because they mean it, that I've really only outgrown <laughs> relatively recently, really. It's a bit of immaturity. Um, but yeah, you know, I used to believe that people meant what they say. And so, you know, it, it's come recently that realizing that when people do that, and I'm not just talking about accountants, I'm talking about 
lawyers, although they're specialists at this, and, and doctors, and uh, you know, even engineers, uh, uh, contractor coming around about some upgrade to your house, whatever, right? And if they start acting like, oh, it's a bit too much, and you know, I don't think you'd be able to understand it, and just take my word for it, and all the rest of it. Um, there's two things that could be going on. One thing that could be going on is you know, that they're trying to trick you um, and mislead you. And to be honest, that's more in my mind we used to go before. But what I've realized now is that actually a lot of the time it's also just they don't know. And rather than acknowledging that they don't know, they have a kind of defensive posture of going into, uh, well, you wouldn't be able to understand, which is really just um, like projection because the truth is they don't understand. And so it's quite... They can kind of honestly say they don't think you'll understand because, of course, they don't understand. So if they don't understand, how could you understand? Um, so, you know, and I think, yeah, as you, as you said, you know, doctors do that uh, a lot. And it's only over the years I've built up the confidence to, you know, not be dismissed. But it's very difficult, um, and especially if you are, you know, in a more vulnerable position, uh, maybe... What's the word? Um, situationally vulnerable, even literally, you know, often like when you're in a hospital and you've got those gowns that if you were to get up and walk away, everyone would see your backside. You know, it's like it's it's all meant to put you in a kind of um, helpless, vulnerable kind of position in one sense. I know that there's practical justifications for it. Um, and so I understand there's lots of subconscious psychological stuff that makes it difficult to resist that authority other than just the basic most humans are pack animals and don't really think for themselves from first principles which is probably the most fundamental thing but there's all kinds of other things that are that reinforce to make it even more difficult to question even if it is your tendency and so uh yeah i would say uh, assuming that you know better than your doctor is arrogance so i'm not advocating for arrogance because you may not but assuming that they know better than you is kind of like a reverse arrogance, right? It's like, I don't know, an assumption of info inferiority on your part, which may not be accurate also. So I'm not encouraging you to go around thinking that you know more than your doctor or any doctor or most doctors. That may well not be the case. I don't know. But what I am saying is just like I would hope that you don't go around assuming you know better than everyone you're talking to. Also, don't go around assuming that uh, someone else knows more than you, especially just because they have a title. Well said. <laughs> Very well said. It's putting the power back into your own hands and understanding there is something you can do about it in those situations, which is really good. Beautiful. So now we're moving on to the next myth here. This one's interesting. Iodine skin deficiency test is accurate. Yeah, it's a very um, specific one. Do you want to describe what that is for people, Christine? Yeah, so essentially that if you um, take a um, bottle of iodine with a dropper and you put one drop onto your skin, that if it doesn't um, absorb within a certain time period, it means that you're deficient in iodine, something like that. Yeah, I think if it, yeah, well, yeah, I think, I'd, I think what it is is if it doesn't completely disappear, um, or if, sorry, if it does completely disappear in less than 24 hours, then they say that that's a sign that, and you know, if it disappears very quickly, like five minutes, that's a sign that you're very deficient. And if it takes longer than less, and basically, yeah, how quickly it disappears shows how deficient you are. Yeah, um, this is an interesting one. I, I, there is a name of the person who it came from. I can't remember off the top of my head, but also maybe I wouldn't say it anyway because it's kind of slandering someone <laughs> but basically someone made that up I think that's the simple way of putting that um, it's not based on any kind of mainstream science and it's not even based on you know something that's not mainstream but like um, but that is validated like in an alternative way to me it is just something that someone made up and then it kind of sounds cool and so a lot of people started doing it. Now, uh, why am I bothered? I think this is one of your suggestions, Chrissy, but the reason why I um, said, yeah, absolutely, let's talk about this one is because this one is a really dangerous one because it is absolutely possible to overdo iodine. So is there such a thing as an iodine deficiency? Yes. 
um, you know, about 100 to 150-ish years ago, there was widespread incidents of this thing called goiter, where people's neck, their thyroid gland specifically, would really swell up. And it was found that in those people, their diet was extremely low in iodine, giving them iodine would reverse that situation entirely or largely. Um, and as a result of that, so iodine is one of the few nutrients, along with some of the B vitamins, iron, these days D3, that, you know, deficiency in a certain case was so severe that it was decided that it, iodine had to be added to a whole class of food to make sure that people did not, were not mass deficient in it because the deficiency was so severe and so problematic. And so, you know, we talked about B1, it was added to uh, wheat specifically. Um, in the US, lots of things were added to dairy, vitamin A and D3, for instance. Um, but in the case of iodine, it was decided that this would be added to salt. And so there's uh, iodized salt. The vast majority of salt is iodized. Um, the sea salt that you get is not iodized, but it is probably still going to contain iodine. Uh, it will contain iodine because the sea contains iodine. So it's still going to have some there as well as it has, you know, a bunch of other trace minerals in there. Um, but yeah, kosher salt generally doesn't have iodine. And um, the uh, like rock salt as well, like Himalayan salt is quite popular. I understand that's, you know, very low in iodine as well. So, but why do I have such an issue with this? Because my understanding is as bad as a real deficiency in iodine is, an excess of iodine is actually just as bad and just as problematic. Well, I'm glad, I was going to say, I'm glad you brought that up because that's another myth that I have down here. So maybe we can tackle these two together is that high dose iodine, iodine is safe and effective. So what I'm hearing is that these are both, yeah, really coming in together. Yeah. And so now I know there's probably going to be at least one person, maybe a bunch of them watching going, Oh, Elwin, I do high dose iodine. It's fantastic. And have you read this book and all the rest of it? Yes, I have read that book <laughs> <laughs> where they talk about high dose iodine and how wonderful it is and all the different mechanisms for why it's so good. And I realize that they give a bunch of explanations and justifications in there as to why some people have a uh, poor response to high dose of iodine. You know, they claim that it's detoxifying too quickly. Um, you know, it does convert to hydrogen peroxide partly, which then um will kill off infectious agents so they also say that like it's the die off that is the um bad reaction to the high dose of iodine so i'm aware of all those arguments however what i'm also aware of um and you know i'll give you another book if, if you want to throw the iodine book at me um the thyroid reset diet by uh alan christiansen uh, naturopathic md and what's interesting about this one um, I'll, I'll just read the subheading to you here. A surprising new plan to reverse the symptoms of thyroid disease. Uh, how are we doing that? Thyroid disease is a hugely important thing. We've talked about a lot here, right? Hypothyroidism, low thyroid function, is a root cause of so many different things, and it is massively underdiagnosed. Uh, so it's a really big deal. Any of our you know repeat uh, listeners, for instance, will be aware of this. Probably a lot of... Um, uh, other people are going to be aware of this. Well, Dr. Alan Christian's perspective is this. Um, he estimates uh, 20 million Americans have some form of thyroid disease and up to 60% of them are unaware. Um, and sorry, I wanted to pull up the correct quote here. Um, so he helps reverse he helps his readers reverse chronic thyroid diseases like hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's with nothing more than a simple dietary change. Well, what could that be? More vegetables, more meat? Nope, just a reduction of iodine intake. Backed by new research showing that proper dietary iodine intake can start to reverse thyroid disease and in as little as four weeks, his diet plan contains the optimal amount of iron and dietary iodine to control thyroid hormones, effectively resetting the thyroid. So. This guy in the UK has 369 reviews. I think in the US a lot more, four and a half stars. So again, I realize there are some people out there doing these very high dose, 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, or whatever of iodine 
and saying that they feel better. And I don't deny that. And maybe it is actually helping them because with some nutrients, there is a massive genetic variation as to what the optimal amount is, right? So it is possible if you feel great on 20 milligrams of thyroid and you genuinely are great, you've done the tests, you know, you're not really hyperthyroid or hyperthyroid or whatever. Fair enough. I'm not arguing with your lived experience. But what I am saying is there are a bunch of other people, like for instance, a lot of these guys' clients and readers, who have the lived experience, and I was one of these people, that's why I can talk about it, who have the lived experience that actually too much iodine causes reduced thyroid function, which of course causes a myriad of other chronic health problems. And that reducing your iron iodine intake will actually potentially in many cases resolve the issue. So I believed that skin iodine thing, uh, Chrissy, you know, 10-ish years ago. And I would you know, use iodine because I thought it was beneficial. And what I've noticed is after I took it, I would feel cold, um, like really cold. And I didn't know what that meant. And, you know, some practitioner or other said it was a detox and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and I kind of stuck with it-ish over a long period of time, not every day, but, you know, I'd have periods of doing it. And then, of course, eventually I... I realized I was hypothyroid, even by the conventional medical perspective. You know, one point my TSH was 6.5, another point it was 4.5. These are, you know, very high to the point that even normal medicine would recognize it as that, you know, 2% of people who had bad hypothyroidism. Would I have had that issue anyway if I hadn't have had that iodine? Obviously, I can't say for sure. You don't know that. But uh, what I do know for sure is that I had symptoms of low thyroid function every time that I took that iodine and what I do know for sure is that a lot of people are healing their thyroid issues by massively restricting iodine in their diet. Why so, do you, th I mean I don't want to detract from the myths that we're on but why do you think that is the case? Uh, you know with a lot of minerals especially too much is just as damaging and dysregulating as too little. I think we can, uh, you know, in terms of the complexities, um, maybe some of the arguments in the iodine book are correct about, uh, you know, maybe it uh, creates too much oxidative damage and maybe it's doing this and maybe it's doing that. But, I, you know, I don't necessarily want to get in the weeds of speculating. All I want to acknowledge is that it is absolutely possible to have too much. I, so I would put iodine in the same category as iron. Some people absolutely need more and f feel better when they get more but some people absolutely have too much and it's it's literally life-threatening you know hemochromatosis i just had a client the other day who has that condition uh medically diagnosed he has to have regular blood draws in order to feel okay uh, in order to well not cause serious liver damage and and all the rest of it it's as i say it's a life-threatening condition and i think the iodine is in that category. And just like with iron, with some people, no matter how much they seem to eat and no matter how much they supplement, <laughs> they never have too much. Uh, but with other people, um, it's almost the, it's the reverse. Uh, like they've got to really restrict the amount they get in the diet and you've got to take things to help block its absorption all the rest of it. And even then, it's still too much. And so I think iodine is in the exact same category. And that's why I think that test, which as I said, is just made up as far as I'm aware. It, there isn't a great indicator that will definitely tell you iodine deficiency. So there's a urinary test. Uh, there is a blood test, although it's pretty rare. There's another marker, I believe, that some people use. But there's not like a consensus that this is definitely the way to tell. Uh, so it's a bit of a tricky one, unfortunately, compared to most of the other nutrients. Um, so I can't tell you this is definitely the way to know, but I can tell you this. The way to definitely not know is that skin test thing. It, it will always tell you that you're low unless you are massively saturated in iodine. Like you have to be having tens of milligrams a day. And remember, 0.2 milligrams a day is the actual recommended daily amount. And that may be too much for some people, as we just you know given an example of earlier. Uh, people who are clients of that particular doctor that I mentioned. So um, I think the range is probably a lot wider than with iron, even though I'll, you know, even though it's the best comparison. Um, 
I probably, you know, maybe the range is something like B3 that we've talked about, where some people need like 100 times as much as other people. That may be the case of iodine. And so I'm not, again, I'm not trying to knock your lived experience. If you have been on 20 milligrams a day for a decade and you feel, and everything is great, proven, tested, then I'm happy for you, right? I'm not against that. But, you know, I remember I did have a client a while ago who had obvious hypothyroidism symptoms. And she also had another practitioner that she went to and, that practitioner had her on high doses of iodine and I was like, I'm never trying to create a conflict in a person's mind. You know, I was just there to give her a genetic, you know, evaluation. That's all I can do. But I just felt it was a shame that this person was obviously having their hypothyroidism created. And I would say actually created because it wasn't that bad. And I, I suspect that if they'd have just reduced the iodine, probably it would have gone away like a lot of this um, doctor's clients, it did. Um, but yeah, they're creating this you know, hypothyroidism, which is a serious contributor to chronic disease just by having this high dose iodine, just by believing this concept that you can actually ascertain someone's iodine needs by this skin test, which is completely uh, made up. I guess all tests are made up, but what I say is it's spurious and not based on anything. Right. I mean, and which is good to know. I mean, it's like <laughs> you, you want to be able to be using something that's going to give you a truthful response uh, so that you can understand and move forward correctly. And also referring back to the episode that we just did about the, um, the right diet, the practical diet uh, using the chronometer app, that is something that somebody can go into, put in their food and because it will show up the amount of iodine you actually are taking. So, you know, that's a, a good point as well if you're curious about it. I think I remember that chronometer, it didn't actually have iodine, but there's definitely other things you can yeah, do I just, to assess iodine. I pulled Is it, it up. There? Yeah, I pulled it up. It's just oh, okay. here. It's under minerals. It's, it's, um, it's under when you create your custom meals. I, I don't know if it's under okay. when you're just doing like the regular diary or anything, but yeah, it's down there under the minerals section. I noticed there's actually a difference between the mobile app that I usually use and the desktop, which we did when we recorded. Yeah. So maybe I'm on that's the desktop. Why it, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, so, okay, so that's good to clarify if anyone else has that same experience. Uh, but yeah, doing that, you can see it's actually very easy to reach the, uh, the recommended daily amount just from food of iodine, right, in a lot of cases. Um, and you don't have to supplement any to, you know, get an amount which is probably sufficient in most cases. Beautiful. So now moving into our next myth for this, um, for our podcast today is being in pain is normal as you get old. Mm. Yeah, this is a good one. And I suppose there's a bunch of things we could put in this category. Uh, what else can we think of that's normal as you get older? Um, you lose your eyesight, you know, it's, you know, you just age, you know, like it, it sucks. <laughs> Essentially getting old sucks is what I hear. More, <laughs> being more frail, being yeah. more strong, a fall, less energy. Yeah, a fall can be extremely damaging and potentially terminal. You know, yeah, there's a lot there. So there is a lot, but I think the pain thing is probably the most common, right? That, you know, if you have a pain and you're 20, then a doctor will be interested and do a bunch of investigations, at least initially. Whereas if you have a pain and you're 60, especially if it's somewhere, you know, normal, like your back or something, they'll be like, you know, what do you expect? Um, <laughs> and so uh, is it normal? No. You know, is it common? Yes. But I would put it in the same category as we talked about earlier about obesity, um is it normal no is it common yes you know uh obviously we said in the case of obesity uh actually we didn't really talk about the root causes but um you know i have in other episodes um and you know it's, it's a combination of different factors uh but you know probably one of the things that's changed significantly in the last hundred years that has increased the occurrence is the poisoning of the mass poisoning of our everything everything that we touch eat drink breathe in um <laughs> have injected into us you know every category seems to contribute to that um and in the case of pain i would say it's really in that similar category now um but there is a bit more to it it's not just poisoning so uh, one of the reasons why it's so common as we get older is because um we're just generally as healthy. And so in that sense, it relates to the same reason why so many people are obese. Um, we're less healthy, we're more poisoned. When we're poisoned, the body inevitably eventually responds with inflammation. 
uh, of obviously inflammation, depending where it is, has a very different experiential effect. So, you know, if it's in the brain, it might make you depressed. If it's in the joints, it might give you pain. Um, but, you know, bottom line um, is, uh, you know, the inflammation and poisoning as well as other issues. Hormonal imbalances, nutritional deficiencies, all the stuff I've talked about many times, you know, can all contribute to that. But probably the thing that's changed the most in the last 100 years is just how much we've been poisoned. Um, but there are other factors as well with pain that I think are worth discussing. Uh, one of them is going back to the kind of more perspective of um, Reich, Reich, Wilhelm Reich and uh, Alexander Lowen, that one of the things that happens as we get older is that we accumulate more and more unresolved emotional conflict. And I guess in terms of talking about people that people are more likely to have heard of, you know, someone like Gabor Mate, mm -hmm. that might be an example yeah, definitely. of someone who talks about this or um, come of the author, but you know, that book, The Body Keeps the Score. Um, so there's this concept that over time, every thing that happens to us that's unresolved, you know, uh, you get fired and it's unfair. This person cheats on you. This person leaves you. Uh, this person dies, you know, all of these things that happen to people. Um, often we, we are busy in our lives and also we are don't want to really address those things. And there's a certain degree of disassociation, disillusion, distraction, all kinds of strategies to not fully face what has happened, uh, understandably, as it's pain and you know, no one wants to deal with things, but uh, if they had, you know, if they could magic it away or deal with it, most people would magic it away. And so, but a lot of people feel like they can magic it away and they magic it away by ignoring it. They magic it away by distracting themselves. They magic it away by drugs of all kinds. Um, but, and maybe they magic it away with more positive things like helping other people, setting goals to achieve things, all of that kind of stuff. But all of the ignoring, even the positive forms, means that on a more biochemical, musculofascial, bodily level, the way that we um, address the feelings that we have from those things happening is in the form of more tension and more distortion in our body. And that builds up over time. I suppose the classic archetype of that that um you know probably is quite old you might have seen it in cartoons in the 60s is you know like the young man is or woman is walking around you know back straight like you know and then by the time you're like 80 you're like hunched over like this and a walking stick I know. And all the rest what's of even it. here in, in the uk i mean there's the sign for the old people crossing the road they're hunched over with the cane i mean yeah. like that's you. it's a stereotype <laughs> <Yeah>. right <laughs> And so there's a reason for that. And look, maybe 200 years ago, it's because people were carrying around so much heavy weight on their neck <laughs> every day. And so that would eventually bend them over. But we know that's definitely not what it is these days. And you still see that postural shift over time in people. And so my understanding of that is that it is the, uh, the weight of all of the trauma and upset and anger and sadness and all the rest of it that the body keeps the score off that is more and more built in the body and so when that is you know first happens it, it doesn't have much of a noticeable impact but it's cumulative just like poisoning in most cases the problem is cumulative not acute and eventually you get to like a tipping point or a breaking point and then it starts to manifest as pain and it really is as simple as that and you know we've talked about this the episode on chronic pain inflammation, I think, that was a very in-depth two-parter where I talk about this in great detail, not just the emotional element, but all of it, the physical and all the rest of it. Uh, but the emotional is a big part of it. Uh, I mentioned the book by Dr. John Sarno, very quick, easy to read book, can be read in like literally about an hour that in many cases helps people to just cure themselves of back pain, not by following a system, just by reading the book. Actually funny, just spoke with a client who said that him and his wife had both read the book. For him, it was not enough, uh, just like it wasn't enough for me, uh, but he had pretty intense past. Uh, but for his partner, it had been. And because although their past was pretty intense as well, it was not 
so intense, <laughs> it wasn't enough. So basically, what I'm saying is if the degree of trauma is very great, then sometimes awareness is not enough to be healing. But in many cases, it's amazing that if you realize that the root of the pain is actually your emotions, in many cases, that's enough for the physical pain to go away. It's literally the physical pain is a mask in one sense, but also a access to another sense to the emotional pain that is there. And you know, the more severe it is, the more that awareness isn't enough and you've got to actually get into it with this kind of stuff we talked about earlier. Like for instance, the Reikian um, bioenergetic therapy stuff or whatever, HANA somatics and um, uh, counter strain are ones that I recommend, but whatever works for people, there's obviously other systems that are more gentle. Um, and others that are more specific, like, for instance, you know, a lot of breathing practices do the same thing, but they only work on the tension around the diaphragm. Uh, EMDR is the same, but it only works on the tension around the eyes, although tension around the eyes is significant um, and can be transformative. Um, so, yeah, there are all kinds of potential strategies for it, but uh, uh, I would look at emotions as a big factor, other than all the stuff that is true for why all the, you know, why chronic health issues get worse in general as people get older. I would say in the case of pain specifically, it's the unresolved emotion that needs to be looked at. And so to go back to the original point, that it's a myth that um, you're just going to have pain as you get older and then that's normal. It is normal because unresolved emotional issues are normal. Um, but it is not inevitable. I guess that's the point. And so, and you do meet people who um, are... You know, not in pain, who are very old, obviously. Now, there is another factor. You can feel my fitness bros screaming at me about this. Um, yes, I realize the amount you move is also a significant factor. But I would actually connect it to this. So, yes, obviously, if you have a sedentary lifestyle your entire adult life, basically sitting the whole time, you are absolutely more likely to be in pain. But I connect it to this emotional issue because as you move, whether it's as simple as walking regularly or, you know, aerobic exercise, resistance training or whatever, all of that movement helps to burn off and dissipate the emotion that it gets trapped in people's body. Now, again, if someone's severely traumatized, it may not be enough. And obviously there are cases of that. Uh, but in many cases, that it is enough to just exercise regularly. Um, it absolutely can do that. And a lot of people know that, right? Uh, one of the most effective things for depression is intense exercise. Like it will absolutely um, help you feel better in a lot of cases. Um, and I'd say part of the reason is because it's just burning off. It's helping to process and move through that sadness. Um, when I say emotion has to be addressed, I don't necessarily mean you go to a therapist's office and you lie on the couch and you talk about it. Um, it could be movement. It could be exercise that helps you address and move through that emotion. Um, you know, there are different techniques, all of which are valid if they work. Um, but yeah, so I would connect that. So if you're screaming at me now, oh, well, the chronic pain is caused by lack of exercise, you're right, but... I would draw that connection to it. And I would also say, look, not everyone exercises a lot and not everyone, and even those people don't inevitably get chronic pain. So I'd still say the emotion is the other factor around it. But yeah, if you move regularly, especially if you do real exercise, and then uh, if you also, you know, have an intention of being aware of how you feel as opposed to suppressing it, um, your chances of having chronic pain as you get older go down a lot. Yeah, I remember when we did the chronic pain episode, you were bringing up the um, Dr. John Sarner's work again about the um, looking inside, you know, looking at the x-rays and the discs and things. And there were some people that had pain and had those damaged discs and some people that didn't have pain. So it's not necessarily that it's causative, you know, even though you're trying to link it. So that's, so that's a really big important thing to go there of as well just yeah really focusing at ah, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's causing that so yeah it's yes yeah good point yeah if you have a herniated disc or a bulging disc or something that your chiropractor is showing you on an x-ray and they say that's why you're in pain ask them does anyone have this and not have any pain that's a great question to ask yeah Wonderful. Great. I'm really looking forward to not being as in pain as I age, fingers crossed. <laughs> and you're doing well with that, Chrissy, uh, right? You're not in any chronic pain? No, 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 and how, no. And how old are you? Am I allowed to ask that? Yes. 
God, I just uh, yeah, I just hit the big five zero this year. So yeah, doing all right, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so congratulations, Chrissy. Uh, Thank you. You look great, but you also feel great. You know, you're at a high level of health. Uh, really, you should be teaching these, not me. Uh, <laughs> so um, you know, you're a great exemplar. And I yeah, I'm not claiming credit for it, by the way. Chrissy's only been with me for two years uh, and she was very healthy before we met. So <laughs> it's not, I don't really, well, I don't deserve the credit for it, but you know, she's a great example of how it is possible to, uh, you know, age gracefully, I guess, as I am also trying to be for you. Um, and that it is possible to rejuvenate and, you know, certainly not suffer from premature aging. And so I'd say, you know, being in pain in your forties and thinking that's because I'm just getting old, that's nonsense, right? Or, or even 50s. Now, maybe 80s, 90s is a bit more defensible, but I, I see plenty of people in their 40s and 50s who are like, oh, it's just part of getting old. It's like, no, it's not. Uh, and Lowen is a great example of this. Alexander Lowen, one of the people who created that system, uh, he died at 98. Um, I don't think he had particularly healthy lifestyles other than very much being aware of his body and addressing these emotional issues. Uh, and, you know, he claimed to always be pain-free you know, throughout his life as well. So, yeah, there's plenty of examples of this well beyond the age of uh, 44 or 50 as well. Yeah, find those examples, shoot for it, see it in your mind, make it so for sure. Our next myth that we have here is medication side effects are rare, can't apply to me. Um, yeah. <laughs> so there's kind of people are in two categories of this, right? They're either maybe what you might call hypochondriac, and I'm more on this side. If, it's like, if I read a side effect, I'll be like thinking, oh, I've got it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm getting it right now. Actually, it's not really anymore, but I definitely had that phase when I had that anxiety a few years ago, where I was definitely having that, thinking I had all kinds of side effects. Um, but I think the majority of people, and that's probably the people using these drugs casually, which is the majority of people, not like me, who, as you said, I know this is one of the ones you came up with as well, Chrissy, um, it doesn't even occur to people that... Um, that these side effects may be applying to them and that it's relevant to whatever they're going through. And I think that's the reason why you brought this one, right? It's because you also talk to a lot of clients and uh, <laughs> it's amazing how often people come with these issues and then you ask them what medication they're on and they tell you and then you look up the side effects or you're already aware of the side effects and you go, oh, it's, it's the issues you've got. It's the issues that you come to me for, right? Like it, it can be as simple as that. And so now we're kind of making, teasing those people a little bit, but of course uh, the truth is, yeah, I mean, ultimately you are responsible for your own body and your own well-being. So it really is, if you are taking something, it is your responsibility to know what the outcome of that is. But of course, in an ideal world, the people prescribing and providing those things to you would also make you aware of those and they do not now if i defend them a tiny bit i think maybe the the legitimate reason why they don't is because unfortunately if you tell someone that they're likely to have a side effect then um they might manifest it with the power of their mind so that is a problem this is a uh, a famous, um, or not famous, well-known phenomena with medical students when they first start learning about all kinds of different diseases that, you know, every disease they learn about, they kind of think they have all the symptoms and, um, and the, you know, the mind is very powerful. Um, we, ha we have an episode about that. I think we need to get out soon. Um, and so, yeah, it is the case that that is the case. However, what is also the case is if you don't tell people and you kind of hide it and, you know, the person giving it to you almost certainly doesn't mention it and then they have it usually in the insert in the box because if they list the side effect, then they can't be sued for it. I believe that's how it works. And so, and so because of that, they kind of list pretty much everything that it could be. It's, it's what it seems like. And so there is a little bit of a laziness aspect to people as well. It's like, you know, it's in tiny little writing. There's this huge list, the majority of words you've never heard of and you probably have to look up because, um, of course, they're not putting it to you in language that's easy for you to understand because they're, they're not putting it there to inform you. They're only putting it there to cover themselves um, legally. And so, yeah, I understand 
that a lot of people are unmotivated. However, uh, sorry, demotivated maybe from becoming aware. Yeah, good However, redirect. these days, of course, <laughs> we do have the internet, right? And so what I would recommend that people do, um, not while already in a state of high anxiety, but maybe in a time when they're already pretty relaxed, um, whether for you that involves a glass of wine, a toke on something, whatever it might be, whatever is going to make you super relaxed and non-anxious and non-paranoid, and just kind of ask yourself, out of the symptoms I've already got, are any of them side effects to what I'm already taking? And that's probably a pretty smart question to ask yourself. Now, even if the answer is yes, that doesn't mean that you stop, right? Because some things, uh, just stopping suddenly is dangerous. Very and dangerous, even yeah. Life-threatening. Yeah. Yeah. So no one's telling you to do that. But what they are saying, what I am saying is become informed. That is your right and really your obligation if you're concerned about your own health, which you must be if you're listening to this. And then follow up with whoever uh, recommended this to you or prescribed it to you and say, um, I'm having this side effect. I think it could be related to this because it is listed as a side effect. I am concerned about it. What can I do? Now, you can judge the quality of the practitioner that you're dealing with partly based on their response. Because the typical thing, unfortunately, is that they will give you another drug to address the side effect. And so this is often the case of how people, so I think the, I can't remember the exact stats, but something like the average person over 60 is on 11 medications, something like that. Um, and usually it's not because they got 11 different problems initially, it's because they have one problem or two problems and then they get given a medication, that creates a different problem, then they get given another medication to address that problem, but that creates a new problem and then, you know, before you know it, they're on a dozen medications. That's usually how it manifests. And so um, if, if the, sometimes if you have to be on that medication and the only way to deal with that side effect is to give you another medication, again, I'm not trying to be black and white about this, but... What I would ask that question, uh, sorry, what I would ask that professional who's recommending that to you is, um, okay, fair enough, if this is what we have to do, then I accept that. But what are the root causes of this disease issue that I have? And how can we help to address them? and ideally even resolve them? Yeah, is there a plan to potentially not have to take this medication forever? You know, what's, what's, what, what can we do? Yeah. And if they basically say, if they show, if they have no interest in addressing the root cause, if the very question is absurd to them, it's probably better to look for a different practitioner. Um, if the question, if the answer they give to that question is um, a kind of dismissive non-answer, um, like it's just, you know, it's just, the way you are in your genetics, um, it's just the way some people are, it's just because you're getting old, whatever, something like that, then you might want to take the same tack because, again, that's not really an answer in most cases. And I'm not saying fire your doctor there and then. I think it's probably better to get a new one first and get a second opinion. Um, and I say that not to cover myself, I mean genuinely. Like most people really are not equipped to... Unfortunately, I wish this were not true, and this is part of the point of this podcast is to help people and make them more equipped, but the reality is most people are not equipped to deal with these complicated issues on their own. Um, but it is about finding, you know, upgrading, improving the help you get, and one of the ways you can tell, they may still not be correct, but if they are at least, if they at least have a theory, an idea about what the root causes are, and they have a plan to address those, and especially if that plan is customized to you rather than being like a one-size-fits-all thing that they tell to everyone then that's a start that's a start in terms of that's someone who may actually be able to help you and in the meantime look you might have to take one medication for the issue and then another medication for the side effects of the first medication and all that that may still be your reality and that may even be the best given your reality but also be working on What's actually this root cause? Let's resolve this root cause. Let's not have this situation going on for the rest of my life. In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. 
However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson, including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. I remember my grandmother, and um, I think, gosh, she was on back in the States when she was really sick. She, well, not really sick, but like towards the, she was older and she just had so many prescriptions. So my mom would have to go in and ask the doctor, okay, what's this one for? What's this one for? What's this one for? And some of them were like, well, that's because she's getting a side effect from that. And that's because she's from that one, then she's getting a side effect from here. Da, 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 da. So it took my mom to go in and go like, okay, well then let's figure this out. She doesn't need to be on all these medications. Like, let's really, t- let's talk about this and make a plan because this doesn't like, that's the, how can I say the quality of life, swallowing all these pills and everything else, causing this, causing that, and so on and so forth. It's like, what can we do about this? And so then that's where, you know, some changes were made, which were really great. So the doctor was on board of figuring that kind of stuff out, which was wonderful. Excellent. And yeah, that's what you just said is not that crazy that a doctor would be okay with it. Like a lot of time, I think, you know, in this country, they're allowed seven minutes per person, you know, which is an absurdly small amount of time to try and work out what's going on with someone. Uh, in this country, you know, I think you have something similar in the US, you know, with this J- G- uh, GP who's supposed to be this generalist who's like a central of authority on everything, who is supposed to be aware of everything you're doing. So that if one specialist puts you on one thing, another different specialist puts you on a different thing, that there's supposed to be someone in the middle coordinating and who has expertise in all of it. Um, but first of all, some of them are just not equipped to understand all the stuff we talked about. Uh, but second of all, I think this is what you've brought up. They may be, but they no one's asked them. Um, you know, they, they barely have any time. Uh, you know, for some people, some people have a belligerent attitude if you're trying to reduce their medications, like, like they don't even want that, you know? Um, it's You know, there's a lot of criticism of doctors like, if someone has this issue, why don't you just tell them to eat better? And da, da, da. But I think one of the reasons is because the lack of, their lack of training in and da, 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 all that stuff that maybe reflects badly on doctors. But another reason is if a doctor tries to do it, uh, a lot of the, the patients are going to be like, I don't want to hear you. I don't want to hear you telling me to eat differently. I just want you to give me a pill. And unfortunately, you know, that's the reality as well. It does go both ways. Um, and so... You know, some of them, even if they are the kind of, you know, barely listen to you, write your prescription, tell you to leave, if you do try and engage with them and say that you have this earnest desire, then there is a possibility, as you just said, that they will listen and that they will try and help. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Always have that conversation. Again, power's in your hands. You guys, you know, you have the power to choose and figure it out. Fingers crossed. (laughs) And so the final myth, well, it's actually kind of three together that are coming in, you know, with the same sort of thing. So I thought I'd clump them all into one. And so here we go. Calories in, calories out makes you fat. Carbs make you fat and fat makes you fat. Yeah, this is something that I have addressed before a little bit, I think, but let me uh, try and address it succinctly here. That'll be my goal this time rather than going for it in great depth again. So Uh, Calories in, calories out, what does that mean? So it's this concept basically that uh, if you, if the amount of calories that you're eating is less than the amount of energy that you are consuming, um, then you will lose weight. That's the basic concept. And so the people who believe that, they're usually pushing diet and exercise. That's all you need to do in order to lose weight. And what do they mean specifically? They mean Less food, less calories, and more movement, more exercise equals weight loss. And so uh, that's the argument. 
And so when you say to these people that there are other factors that influence that, like the speed of your metabolism, uh, which you know, is dependent on thyroid function, for instance, as well as other things, uh, as well as maybe estrogen levels, as well as maybe insulin resistance, as well as progesterone, as well as testosterone, all this other stuff. Um, they don't like that. They get upset about that because they think that you are trying to avoid their simple truth. And their simple truth is basically you just need to eat less and exercise more and you will lose weight. Stop coming up with excuses. Stop complicating things. That's generally their perspective. Um, and then, of course, you know, another aspect that you mentioned then, as you say, you love them together correctly, um, is, you know, some other people would say it's not as simple as calories in, calories out, because um, I am on a diet where I pretty much all carbs and I'm losing weight no matter how many, how many calories I have. And then there are other people saying, well, it's not as simple as calories in, calories out, because I am on a diet where I have no carbs and I'm losing weight no matter how many calories I have. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think, yeah, let's address all of that together. So I, I want to address the all you need to do is eat less and move more because I think that's like the number one myth that is normally um, that is normally pushed by those who are, you know, not necessarily wrong in their own experience, but a little bit ignorant of uh, the, diver the diversity of different bodily situations that exist within the human race. Um, so I, know, I want to address it at its core. So, and again, I've tried to say where these people are always right first, or these ideas are right before I, <laughs> uh, what's the word, uh, talk about why they're also myths. So where people are right is technically it's true. Calories in, calories in, calories out is technically true in that it is true if you are burning more calories than you are taking in, then you will lose weight. So that's true. So why am I even arguing? Well, because their uh, understanding of what I just said and what they would say is just more unsophisticated, I would say. So it's true that if the amount of calories or energy coming in is less than the amount that you're burning, that you will lose weight. However, the then conclusion that they draw from that, therefore, all you need to do is take in less calories and all you need to do is move more. Well, wait a minute. One doesn't necessarily equal the other. Does that make sense? Like there may be more to it. And the bit where there's especially more to it is in the burning phase. So the calories out phase. Because what we are basically saying is there are some people, and again, this is disputed, I know, but... That I've come across people and I believe them, um, where they say, I barely eat anything and I'm exercising and I'm, lo I'm not losing weight or I'm even gaining weight. And some of them are tracking it and some of them are honest. Uh, not everyone, I realise this is one of the, what's the word, criticisms of this argument, but I don't believe everyone is lying, all the millions of people who say that this doesn't work. And um, so... But the thing is, the explanation is actually really, really simple. There is more that determines how many calories you burn only than how much you move. That's the incredibly simple resolution to this apparent conflict. Like, there are other things you can do to burn more than move more. And in fact, there are other things you can do to burn less than move less. And so that comes back to the whole critical issue of metabolism. The number one thing that controls how many calories you burn is not really how much you move, it is your metabolic rate. It is how effective and efficient your uh, mitochondria are at taking the substrates of energy production, uh, like gluto glucose, ketones, and uh, oxygen, and transforming them into energy, and the rate, so the efficiency at which they do it, and the rate at which they do it. The number one thing that affects the rate at which that happens um, is thyroid, as we've talked about before. So uh, increasing T3, which is the active thyroid hormone, and increasing T3 activation in the mitochondria is like pressing the accelerator on that rate of energy production. And reducing the T3 is like pressing the brake on that rate of energy production. But there are other factors. You know, we've talked about red light very recently. This is another signal just like T3, 
that if you increase red light, you in increase the rate of that energy production. There are all kinds of poisons, which was about poisoning maybe being the root cause or primary root cause of the um, uh, obesity epidemic, that will reduce that rate of metabolism. Um, and, you know, seed oils being one that's particularly, you know, popular to criticize in both our community and recently also surprisingly I've seen in the mainstream media, um, that they have a metabolism slowing effect. They reduce that rate of metabolism. And 100 years ago, they were maybe 2% of our total calorie intake. Now they're an average of 30% of our total calorie intake. We're probably evolutionarily adapted to them being about 2%. We are absolutely not adapted to them being 30%. And, you know, we really can't handle that um, without it substantially slowing our metabolism. Uh, you know, soy uh, contains goitrogens that slow down our metabolism. There is soy in almost everything these days. It's one of those heavily subsidized foods that we talked about earlier. Um, so government takes money from us by threat of force, then uh, spends part of that money on encouraging the growth of a crop, which then is put in almost all our food, which then slows down our metabolism, which then makes us sicker and more overweight. That's the, the kind of the circle of poisoning as it is uh, happening right now in most uh, industrialized countries. Um, so there are things like that, let alone all the other stuff, you know, like your glyphosate and your atrazine and your uh, different E numbers into different colorings and your preservatives and all the rest of it, which I won't even get into. Uh, the reason I like to talk more about the seed oils and the soy is because I regularly talk to clients who consume these things thinking they're being healthy. Right. <laughs> I mean, well, yeah, because out there it's heart healthy or, you know, make sure you have this and yeah. Yeah. I, I recently had a client who I, I said, I don't want to be offensive, but your diet kind of looks like a a person in the 1990s idea of a healthy diet um and it was like tofu and you know flaxseed oil and you know all of this kind of stuff that um you know back then we used to think <laughs> was like you know the pinnacle of health and now we realize it's you know probably not actually helping us but unfortunately there are a lot of people i remember when uh, we moved to portugal back in was it 2013 and the health food stores there and they're all full of this stuff that they were like 10 years behind or something. Like, you know, they thought soy was like the healthiest thing still. And, you know, it was kind of interesting to see that. Whereas, you know, when I went to LA, which I was also doing at the time, they were a bit more ahead, you know. Not the general public maybe, but, you know, in the health food stores, they were at least ahead of this and they kind of knew that maybe that wasn't the pinnacle of health anymore. Um, so anyway, yeah, so that's why I pick on those things because I hope that our viewers are not already eating foods with a large amounts of pesticides and, uh, um, you know, E numbers and all the rest of it, but I suspect they, you know, a bunch of them are still having <laughs> omega sixes and soy and stuff like that. So um, anyway, so there are things that you can be deficient in, which will slow the calories out portion of the equation, right? Like for instance, thyroid hormone and red light and a bunch of other nutrients as well. You know, B one, B three, B seven, etc. And there are a bunch of things that you can be poisoned with, which will slow that calories out. And so that is why this uh, idea that all you need to do is exercise more, how is that going to help with lack of thyroid hormone? Well, it actually won't, and it will actually make it worse. Um, how is that going to help with lack of red light? It's irrelevant unless you happen to be exercising in a red light environment, I guess, which most people don't. Um, and, you know, going to the gym and doing it while being flooded with blue light will have the exact opposite impact, as we just mentioned earlier. Um, and also, you know, the other criticism of this simplistic theory that's often used is if we talk about calories in for a sec, so part of what they talk about is, right, more exercise, but also eat less, right? If you just eat less. But the problem is, if you eat less, by reducing calories in, you also reduce calories out because the body goes into a bit of a starvation mode, it slows down the metabolism, it goes into hibernation mode. And um, this is why a lot of the time when people diet, they get some gains initially in terms of how much they lose, but then it kind of plateaus. And then eventually when they give up, which will happen sooner or later, uh, in you know, almost anyone, because they, not because they're weak-willed necessarily, but because they're just starved of sufficient nutrition, then, um, 
the, they will go back to the calories in, will go up again, but the calories out will stay low because the body doesn't trust it. It's still in a starvation mode. And that is why, you know, 97% of people who do this simplistic eat less, move more approach uh, after a year have not only not lost weight, they've gained some weight, right? I think that's the stat from Weight Watchers uh, or something like that. So this is not... And, you know, we talked about this in a different episode, but to kind of force yourself to carry on starving yourself with things like Ozempic or amphetamines, which is more the, you know, the strategy back in the 60s that doctors would give, um, are, you know, very dangerous and problematic. But we talked about that in a different episode. I won't go through it again. Um, but, you know, it fits into that. So, yeah, CECO, calories in, calories out may be right. But the idea that may be right, though it may not be as simple as that, I think we'll talk about that and we have a guest coming soon, I think, who's going to dispel that from a different angle and we've talked about it before. Um, but this idea that all that means, therefore, is just eat less and move more is absurd. It's not just wrong, it's ridiculous to anyone who actually understands anything about health. And to those who are you know, arguing out loud or in their head to that right now, but oh, when I did it, I reduced my diet and I moved more and it worked for me. Well, that's fantastic. And the thing is, if people are metabolically healthy, then they're going to be metabolically flexible. And so what does that mean? It means that um, if they do temporarily eat less, like a cutting phase, for instance, for a young, healthy, fit person, um, and move more, they may well lose weight. And then when they start eating more again, their metabolism speeds right back up again. And so they keep the weight off, and it works. And that's awesome. And if you're one of those people, great. But you have to understand that's not everyone. A lot of people, their metabolism doesn't bounce right back when they start eating more again. And a lot of people, um, uh, they don't even lose weight when they reduce their caloric intake because their body straight away like adapts to that um, you know, slower metabolism. Uh, state and probably it was in that slow metabolism state in the first place and that's why they had problems losing weight and were overweight in the first place and so if that's the reason why they're overweight in the first place that strategy is only exacerbating the problem it's not helping <laughs> yeah it's a good thing to discuss because you know there's i think there's a lot of confusion out there okay like this that especially as we were talking about as individuals age you know the pounds start coming on people don't know quite what's going on and uh, it can be very very frustrating for individuals to try and figure out i just don't know what to do you know they could just throw their hands up in like frustration and not know what what next steps to take so and, I've, and that's a good point. And I've talked very globally so far, but let's just talk about a couple of more localized issues. So if it does show up specifically really more around the belly and it's not really that much the rest of the body, then we can be looking more at, because we're talking mainly about thyroid, so thyroid and hormones, but if it's specifically around the belly, we should be looking at insulin resistance. And we should be testing uh, at least fasting insulin and fasting glucose, doing that, um, uh, what's it, HDMR? Um, it's in our uh, insulin episode anyway. That test, that insulin resistant episode, that, that test that assesses uh, whether you have insulin resistance. I think there is a um, test that will kind of do it for you, but the slightly cheaper and more easily available one is just to get fasting insulin and fasting glucose um, and see if that may well be the issue, and it often is. And ditto if your accumulation of uh, fat is especially around the hips and thighs and butt, that is more of an estrogen issue. Uh, it does happen sometimes in men. You can see these bottom heavy men sometimes wobbling uh, around when they walk, but it is definitely more common with uh, women. Um, and so uh, again, if it is localized, if it is, you know, generally you're not overweight at all, but it's you specifically gaining it around that area, then it may not be any of the things that we've talked about uh, primarily, although they will be factors, it may be primarily this hormone imbalance of excess estrogen or estrogen dominance. And so, uh, you know, in the case of women, it's reasonably easy to address to some degree, but just by adding in progesterone, much more difficult to address at its root because at its root, it's probably, you know, related to uh, chronic stress and, you know, poisoning and stuff that is much more difficult to resolve. Um, but yeah, so 
those would be like the obvious examples of if it's localized. And then, of course, I guess another example um, that's not localized, but that again is a bit of an exception, is if it's water weight, you know? So holding on to a lot of water weight can be another classic sign of thyroid dysfunction, low thyroid function, but it can be other things, you know? It can be issues with the kidneys uh, and the heart and the cardiovascular system. And so uh, it can be issue with the adrenals, with the aldosterone. Um, and so, you know, those would be some examples of uh, other things to look at as well. But again, all the examples I just gave, none of them eating less and moving more is going to resolve. And I guess that's the, the through line. Beautiful, Elwyn. Well, I'm glad we were able to bring these myths to the light and um, and share them with our lovely listeners. Um, before we finish here, was there anything else that you wanted to add as final thoughts? Yeah, I don't think we really got into fat and carbs, but I think we're out of time. That might be an interesting one to do another time because I have a theory about this that I don't, I've never heard anyone else say, I'm probably not the first to come up with it, but at least it's not common. So I'd like to put this out to kind of resolve the issue about why you know, extremely low fat works for some people, extremely low carbs works for other people. Yes, part of it is down to genetics, like I said before, but I think there's another reason which I don't hear talked about. So that would be another topic we can get in at uh, some other time. Um, thank you for watching. Please uh, leave your feedback. As you've seen, I always reply if you do it on YouTube. Uh, and I try and, although Rumble makes it a lot more difficult, unfortunately, to find comments, but uh, <laughs> try and also reply on Rumble as well if you're on there. Uh, if you're not ready, please make sure that you uh, go to the website, uh, feel younger or geneticinsights.co, and when you get a pop-up offering you a discount or a free gift or whatever it might be at the time you see this, uh, you know, go for it, put your email address in there because I am getting a little bit more controversial these days. I am saying stuff that some of these platforms don't like. So there is the possibility, um, actually, let me not be negative. Let me just say, that guarantees that we will stay connected if you actually uh, you know, come onto my platform. I will not barrage you. I think we probably set up like a few emails to go out when you first subscribe. But other than that, I send out one email a week, if that. Often I don't even get around to that. So don't worry, I'm not going to send you a ton of emails. Uh, but that means that you know we can stay connected uh, no matter what happens out there in the big bad world. So yes, as Alwyn said, please make sure that you do leave your likes, your comments below in the comments section and your questions. Uh, you know, for right now, Alwyn, I, I can see because I'm going in and I'm checking on him, making sure he is responding. <laughs> so definitely leave them there. And, um, you know, we love bringing this to you. So if you guys can, please do support our sponsors so that we can continue to bring this to you at no charge. Please remember to hit the like and subscribe button so you don't miss an episode and we'll see you next time. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. You may have noticed I recommended a few different videos in that episode. And one of the ones I recommend is just here if you want to click there. Or another one I recommend is just below if you want to click on that one and watch that next.